Um, I bragged before about the Manadnock region being the most collaborative community in the state, maybe in New England. But that we do have a, a second place group, and that's our North Country. Because they get whacked every week with something, and they still keep coming back or holding on. Uh, and there was a conference up in the North Country, I'm told, very much like this, uh, a little while back. And one of the speakers was going on and on and on. He had about 90 minutes to go, so he was only about halfway done. And a fellow from the, near the front of the uh, audience got up and started heading out the door. And the speaker knew him. And he said, Mr. Merrill, where are you going? The fellow turned around without breaking his whistle. I'm going to get a haircut. <laughs> Mr. Merrill, why didn't you get a haircut before I started speaking? He just yelled out, I didn't need a haircut before you started speaking. <laughs> so we are going to listen to some speakers now, um, and, but they won't be taking 180 minutes. But we will need your attention because the information they're going to put out is going to be very useful in this afternoon's work groups and adding it to what Amy and Hannah had to, to share with us. Um, so we'll hear from each of the speakers first. You have their biographies attached to your um, uh, agenda. We'll hear from each of them first and then we'll have, they'll all stay up here at this front table and we'll have a panel of Q&A. So, in your package, you should find some three by five cards. If you can locate those, or a piece of paper. Uh, and as you hear a speaker raise an issue, or mention a fact, or mention a, a, a projection that you have a question about, please jot that down so that you still remember that question after you've heard our final speaker. Uh, and we can go back to it, and, and I'll get the microphone to each of them here at the table, and they can. They can respond to you, okay? So our first uh, speaker who is going to um, kind of give us the state of education in our region right now and what, what, what educators are trying to do uh, before we hear from those who use the products of our education, the employers, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Wayne Woolrich, who's known to many of us, and we know him as the superintendent of SAU 29. So Wayne, please. the conversation uh, this morning, especially in the way uh, that we were able to make connections, that sort of deeper learning connections. And I'm, I'm here to say that we're very fortunate because that is the emerging direction that I'll be speaking to you about. Also, a sort of flashback when uh, Sue Stoke mentioned All in the Family. I don't know if you raise your hand if you actually saw All in the Family. And I thought, what a great example that was in regards to juxtaposing one generation, traditionalists, with the baby boomers. I mean, in my group, it was, can you believe what Archie Bunkers did? Can you believe what he said? And then, obviously, in my father's group, it was, uh, can you believe what Meathead was up to? And how would you like to have that guy for a son-in-law? But the reality is, it brought those social issues into our living rooms, into our homes, where they, typically were never talked about, or very little. The technology that we're experiencing in our schools is doing the same thing. This is transformation. This is a huge confluence of technology and traditional uh, education. The stand and deliver that most of you are familiar with, where the expert in the room was the teacher, is all changing and it's just dissolving before our eyes. In our in Keene School District, we have now a bandwidth that enables us to use tablet, which is the technology of choice, to really be accessible in every classroom. And in some of our classrooms, Fuller, for example, in our elementary school, we have students uh, who are using that technology, that wireless technology, to integrate learning in, with technology in the content area. That's sort of our pilot. We're doing some of that elsewhere. With this inexpensive tablet technology, we also have visual representation uh, with an Apple 
TV, which is very inexpensive, projects everything on the wall. Teacher can go around the room, interface with students, Google, and add value or add expertise. Meanwhile, students can go home, uh, access tutoring from Khan Academy to those targeted uh, examples that are available through our technical companies. A principal or a supervisor can walk through a classroom with their tablet, notice something that they think needs direction or where professional development might be appropriate, and quickly email the teacher the YouTube or the video that might be appropriate to that redirection. This sort of technology is interfacing throughout our school, and when you look at this new, I call them the digital, although Gen Edge uh, certainly uh, fits, if you look at how they're accustomed to this technology and the way that this learning is changing, uh, indeed, those students, when they become uh, ready to be employed, I believe, will have a very different mindset. And when I saw the uh, slide that had the lines go going everywhere, I'm reminded that that is the way in which they do business, which is great for us. Uh, because that collaborative decision making, that group thought development, is really where I think our next opportunity, uh, certainly in New England and I think in this region, to compete internationally, that's where our strength lies. So I'm very excited about all of this. I'm going to take you quickly, uh, and I just have a few minutes, but I want to take you quickly through some of the confines, as Mr. Logan spoke earlier, and also some of the opportunities through our challenges uh, that I think will make you feel much better about where we're heading in education. First of all, I have to say, I have no idea how the moves actually move, but my Gen X millennial cusper uh, does that sort of thing. It's magic, but it seems to always work. She showed me how to Skype uh, a few months ago over the box, all of a sudden people from far away show up. I mean, all of this is magic to me. But to her, it's his second nature. So I'm going to just quickly go through sort of how we got here and begin with those that war on poverty, Lyndon Johnson's Title I. And most of you kind of hear Title I, but don't understand what kind of impact it's had on education. Title I, currently in Keene, for example, we received $962,000. That's our outlay this year, according to Jan Berry, our Title I director. Uh, that is to make certain that we do, that we can make absolutely every student who is determined to be socioeconomic disadvantaged to make sure that they can read and do math at grade level. So all of that money has come in. That came in beginning in 1965. It's still in, embedded in No Child Left Behind, the current version of the ESEA. That is money that is a expected to show a result of all students being at grade level by 2014 in reading and math. If public schools don't get those students at grade level in that subset, there are sanctions that are pretty serious from tutoring, from choice school, from redirecting governance, uh, from um, getting rid of staff. Those are the kinds of things that happen for schools who don't make that progress towards 2014. In 1975, we had the Individual for Disabilities Education Act, and that dramatically transformed. That was another boomer idea that we can, I claim those, we can all do it. We're going to target uh, poverty. We'll target uh, special needs students because we understand in some districts those students are not being educated appropriately, and consequently, we'll mandate and we'll promise, and this is Congress, that we'll uh, supply 40% of the revenue. Uh, they currently supply 18% and it's going south. So that part wasn't too good, but the idea is great and it really transformed education. As with our socioeconomic disadvantaged population, where we have to currently be at 91% proficient in reading, 88% in math in order to make adequate yearly progress, we have to make that same target with special needs students. So at about, in Keene, for example, about 20% of our students are designated special needs. And of that group, we have to make sure that 
are at proficiency in reading, 88% in math, those numbers will go up next year. That's a very serious challenge, and we've had some trouble in some of our schools making that hurdle, I'll be honest. Nation at risk in 1984, that's where education hit the total quality management, the Japanese idea, uh, and uh, Ronald Reagan saying that if a, another nation came in and imposed the education system on America, we would uh, call it an act, we would assume it to be an act of war. Really what that meant is when we looked around the world, the United States was very low, uh, especially in math and science, relative to some other countries. Their ability to target resources, all had a national curriculum, uh, was seemed to be better than ours. Our ability to allow school districts, local school districts, to create the curriculum, to create any assessments, and then to end up with students who could compete with students from Japan, Europe, at that point wasn't assumed to be appropriate. So consequently, there was a huge push in math and science, and if you look at the Goals 2000, which began in 1994 under Clinton, that was the approach to get the goal, number one, was to be first in math and in science worldwide. Number two was to have all students ready for school. And number three was to reduce the dropout rate uh, to 90%. By the way, if you were to look at our school, our schools in the Manadnock region, you'd find that they were probably currently in the top three worldwide if we were to rate them as a group, uh, and at, at worst in the top five. So we're really talking about nationwide. We've never been able to have a, a, an ability to inform the rest of the country in a way that we could clearly get out the message because every state had its own way of assessing students. Until Goals 2000, when Clinton said, well, you know what, let's assess students at fourth and eighth and 11th grade, we'll sample, so not obviously, maybe 10 or 15%, but it will be statistically significant. And we found that students in New Hampshire typically rank in the top third, or top three, uh, in English and math, in fourth grade, eighth grade, and 11th grade. Our students here are very well educated if you look at that comparison. It's not good enough, but it's one way that we can determine where we are. No Child Left Behind, everyone here has heard of No Child Left Behind, came in 2002, uh, Senator Kennedy, uh, Senator Gregg from New Hampshire co-sponsored that legislation, 80% of senators approved it. Uh, it was about the same in the House, very solid support. And what it said was that every public school uh, in America had to make this target in reading and math or turn into a public charter school, find some other governance model, in other words, hire a company to come in, provide tutoring, all these other things if we didn't make that hurdle. So that's been very controversial because not all districts are making a adequate yearly progress. In New Hampshire, 70% of schools last year did not make adequate yearly progress. But then if you look at other states, Tennessee, for example, where many students make adequate yearly progress, or many schools, very small percentage of schools did not make adequate yearly progress. But if you look at their NAEP, or that fourth, eighth, and 11th grade assessment, you find out that in Tennessee, uh, they were 46th or 47th, depending on the assessment. So the federal government saying, you know, this really isn't very fair. Uh, our employers don't know where the good education is in America. Uh, we were hearing from military people who say, listen, our, our average family moves six times, and every time they move from one state to another, they have a different assessment, different curriculum, different scope and sequence. We heard from colleges that were saying, listen, a third of the students you're sending us from high school are taking art remedial courses. And as a consequence, we're spending money to educate students when really they're not receiving credit for all of this effort. Can't, you must do better. Then we looked at the international scale, and we found that we were doing very, very poor relative nationwide relative to most industrialized countries. So the governors, because they were pushed by business and industries, and the commissioners got together 
Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation got this whole thing rolling and said, listen, we need higher standards. We need standards that are more rigorous, that deepen learning. We cannot anymore rely on a state-by-state -state assessment where we really don't know what's happening. We have all this great research now, especially given that everyone started testing in 2002. Let's use it and let's create some new standards. New standards were created. New Hampshire adopted them in 2010. They are much more rigorous. They involve the best of uh, other countries and the best standards in the U.S. They're called college and career ready standards. That's where we are today. We are right now with all of our students in all of our schools beginning that transition. We will be assessed over college and career ready standards in the spring of 2015. That's great news for our students because the standards are more clear, easier to understand for our teachers, textbooks, and technology, because 45 states have adopted this common core, really interface. The tests are cheaper, they're computer assessment, uh, so a student who maybe gets an answer wrong, takes a little bit easier question, or gets it right, a little harder question, students don't take as long to take the test, but the results we get are much better. That's the common core, you'll be hearing about that, and that is great news for New Hampshire. It's also great news for people who want to show off New Hampshire and the quality of education. If you're a business, you want to bring in employer, employees, and you say, listen, come to our region, where we are one of the top few states around public education in the country, and we can prove it. We have a common core assessment called Smarter Balance. If you look at other states, you'll find New Hampshire if we're not in the top three, I'll be very surprised that 2015 will be some assessment. It'll be because we failed in the transition. So I'm very excited about that for employers. I'm very excited about that for people coming in to trust the money they're spending on public education. We spend $63 million just in Keene annually, of course, over 80% of it for staff, but that's a big commitment, and we want to prove that the commitment really works. I'm not going to go through all of this because I think I've covered it, and I think most of you agree that our students that were coming into our, our business and industry uh, were not able to maybe uh, really engage at an entry level. Either they didn't have reading comprehension skills that were appropriate, either they, or they couldn't uh, do math uh, that would be appropriate. This will help change that. The standards, as I said, higher level thinking skills, much, much deeper We've had uh, two districts, Harrisville and Chesterfield, already pilot the test, and the teachers were amazed at the level of complexity uh, of these questions compared to the rote memorization recall of the current assessment that we're given. So this is great, great news for New Hampshire. Another piece of great news for New Hampshire is the, I'm gonna move through because I know my time is up. I want to let you know that average SAT scores, if you look at Keene High School, over 70% of students go to college from Keene High School, typically. If you look nationwide, uh, SATs, much, much smaller percentage of students take it. If you're in-state, in many states, you don't have to take the SAT, and most don't. In New Hampshire, we have a higher percentage of students that take it, and we do better than uh, national average. This is critical reading, and you can see we do better. We have an issue with writing currently. This is our last SAT, and we are targeting uh, looking at writing and seeing how to do that better. That will definitely show with Common Core. So those are some things that I just want to let you know as employers. Of course, our counselors know this, our, our staff, but it's good to remember this is a place that has potential employees who should be ready to go, and we should be able to attract business and industry to this region if they're looking for employees who can do this sort of thing. Uh, also, in New Hampshire, where in some states dropout rate is 25-30%, we were at 4% when we adopted a new law uh, under Governor Lynch. Uh, that was in 2007. I was, you know, I personally thought how we're going to make this happen. We've gone to about 4% annually at Keene High to 1%. So we've taken three quarters of dropout. So we're not only doing better on our assessments, but we are graduating more students. We've done that pretty creatively 
uh, with, we've allowed ourselves to create schedules that fit students' life, real life. Uh, if they need to be in school after at night, community education. Jan, are you right here? Uh, Director of Community Education has really made that system work uh, for these students. So they can go right on through. If they're behind in, in credits, they can go during the day and at night. They can be dual and enrolled. If they only can go at night, they can still make that happen. So we really enabled those students who are disenfranchised for whatever reason, bringing them back in and giving you graduates uh, from Keene High School. This is the next step, and this has to do with a waiver request, which we're likely to get because 37 states have received it. It's a request to change our model from the proficiency that I mentioned, 91% currently in reading and 88% in math, to a student growth percentile model. This is huge because it takes those students who were not, or maybe not part of our initial focus around getting to proficient makes all of our students part of the part of the scene for us. Briefly, we'll use student growth percentiles now to determine schools that are making adequate progress. Student growth percentile means that each student will be judged against the group of students that scored where they scored the previous year. So if they were at 30% in 2012, in 2013, they'll be judged only against the students who are also in the 30%. So if they made, the, if they're in the top third, they will have made high growth. If they're in the middle third, they'll make typical growth. And if they're in the bottom third, they'll make low growth. So we'll be able to look at every student and say, this student, you know, maybe they could have managed that proficient uh, label on the test without really working very hard, but they will be rated, ranked against their peers. So this is really shifting that model from, you know, we give 40, 470 ribbons to, you know, if you're in that top third, you'll get a high growth label. If you're in the middle third, you're typical. Why aren't, here's, here are the goals to get into that top third. So that will change our classrooms. We'll, we'll be, there's a, this year, in this Mrs. This Jones classroom, we grew, this class grew at a high growth at a typical growth, at a low growth. We'll be able to do this with, for schools. You'll do this for your districts, and it'll be done for the state. We'll be able to use this against other states, given that we're using the same assessment. So this is big news for employers, because all students will be closely monitored, and growth, which is along a better continuum, because we'll have a better assessment and better standards, and I think we're really gonna make some big move, and all of that begins in 2015. We're making the conversion now. So our schools, I think, when we look at emerging directions, obviously technology is a big player, and it will influence all that we do. Uh, our ability, I mean, the largest growing high school currently in New Hampshire is a virtual high school, uh, where students no, never attend class in a room. We understand that the walls of the schools are coming down. We're trying to interface it in a, in, in a way where the transition is smooth, where gen, uh, or baby boomers, and in some cases traditionalists who are teaching, do not feel disenfranchised, but feel like they're part of that equation. So I've just given the time out. I would like to mention Keene High School is moving up in, uh, sub in, in courses. At 25 right now. It wasn't long ago, we had to have 20 credits for Brandon King High School, and in a few years, we'll be 28. So that's uh, where students are currently going. It's my last slide. I thank you. I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for that. Am I on? Yes. Thank you, Wayne, for that picture of what's going on in, in the region educationally. Uh, and I like your, your phrase about uh, looking at, you know, at emerging directions. So let's see how the emerging directions of the schools match up with some of the emerging directions of, of our employers. And the first employer group that we're going to hear from, which you will represent 
the group of employers by looking at what's going on in her own uh, corporation is Maureen Curtis, who is the director of the uh, critical motion product sector for Timken Aerospace. Maureen? Step in front of the podium for a second because there's a reason I'm dressed this way. <laughs> so I wanted to, to level set what our first priority is when we make things it's being safe. That's not your parents' manufacturing, it's not your granddad's manufacturing or your uncle. We spend probably every meeting we start off with in communication with folks, making sure that we're safe, we make quality products, and we serve our customers. There are folks in the room from Timken, but it could be any manufacturing company that I talk to or work with, work with or network with around the state or in the country mm -hmm. or globally. We need to make sure that we make products, but how we make products and how we innovate is so important to what we do. And it's not what you would think about in terms of manufacturing where it's a dark place. You go there, you stay there forever, you do the same thing. It's really an innovation place. So I have equipment in our facility that's older than I am, but it makes precision products that are competitive worldwide. I also have equipment that we're learning how to, to develop and make at a technology center in our company in Canton, Ohio. <coughs> And I think of the dichotomy of that, which is we need folks that are going to come, be safe, and run equipment, and we're going to teach them how to do that. But we're also going to need the engineers, the technicians, the quality folks that are going to save us money over time and have us be able to make products that are sold globally. It's a heck of a challenge. And there are folks that have small businesses. I know there are folks in this room that have less than 10 or 12 people that make things. So it's not just metalworking, it could be computer electronics, it could be t-shirts, it could be um, services that are, end up in products that are manufactured. But if you think about what manufacturing does to a community, let's change the focus from it's this dark place where you kind of do the same thing you, you've done forever and understand that it's the economic driver for New Hampshire and many other states. What's the biggest contributor to livable wage jobs in New Hampshire? Do you guys know? What's the biggest sector that drives the paychecks that come and buy all the products that you want to get from beyond? It's manufacturing. Maybe not in volume of jobs, but jobs that earn livable wages. And it's important that we pay our folks enough to be able to have family, whether that's they got a degree or not. And so I heard from Wayne talk about a lot about the college prep, and this is exciting to me because, for me, I want folks that are going to be operative associates that have taken college prep courses. And I don't think this differs from anybody else in the room. So STEM education, if I was going to show you a Timken outreach for education, STEM are for me STEAM, so we add arts in there, so science, technology, engineering, math, and arts. We want creative problem solvers. I can teach you how to run a piece of equipment. That was my first job. I was a manufacturing engineer. That's what I had to do. Learn it and then teach it to somebody. And then make it go better, faster, or whatever. I can't teach you how to solve a problem. Because that takes years of trial and error and being able to fail and learn something. And often you learn those in science-based courses. We have to do an experiment. You have to think about what are the possible outcomes. You need to mess it up. You need to go fix it, learn the right answer or a different solve, way to solve a problem. You need to learn it in collaboration and communication. I try to think of my day in preparing for this and saying, how many meetings am I in because we want the team to come to a solution? And that's the, the border line we're going to have, which is today knowledge is accessible here. Anybody can look anything up that I'm going to tell you about, right? So I don't need to teach people how to access information. Our kids know it. They're better than us than, than we are. They're like, OK, give me your online resources. Awesome. What they don't necessarily know how to do is communicate to each other about, well, how would you solve that problem? And I mean at all levels. So I want an operator to come in and say, you know, the machine's not working quite right today. 
hey, and this goes to the, the, the learning across the ages, we have some of, the, uh, of an age workforce. How did you solve this problem last time? What's the work instruction say? Should we get a manufacturing engineer out there? Should we get somebody from quality? Let's talk about it, let's, let's communicate. Those communication skills are hugely important to solving problems, because if you don't talk about it, nobody knows it's a problem. And for our world, days matter. It can't be something we don't resolve quickly. We have a due date for that customer, and they're depending on us. And for my world, our customers are very present when they don't get what they want. And I think that might be the disconnect a little bit with education. You don't see your customers, and today is exciting because we're your customers. And we aren't present enough when we're not getting what we want. So I talked a little about knowledge. It's not what you know, it's how you access it and communicate it and solve problems with it. It's that you try things, you fail, and you succeed, and you solve problems, and you're going to take some wrong roads. That's how you get innovation. It takes communication skills. And that's a hard thing to teach unless you do it and practice it and work on it. It takes folks that are going to be college ready and those that aren't. Keeping the college age folks here is a challenge for us. We have a lot of engineering positions open. It takes us a long time to build them. And typically it's with out of state folks. And that's disappointing. I'm from out of state, so I'm glad we have jobs here. <laughs> But it's disappointing if you, we make those relationships and they just don't know whether it's a connection with us. And I don't put that on education. I look at the businesses and say, how well are we network? Do folks know we have those jobs? Do they intern with us? Do they understand what we have open? So I want to talk to you a little bit about creativity and why that matters to me. I can tell you that the best ideas do not come from me sitting in my office. They don't even come with my leadership team, which is pretty diverse. It's got men, it's got women, it's got um, people with the finance backgrounds, uh, manufacturing bounce backgrounds, marketing backgrounds. It comes from them listening to customers and all the folks in the organization. So if we don't get creative about, hey, I don't know if this will work, here's an idea. We aren't going to solve many problems, and we also aren't going to come up with whatever the next product is. And for me, to be in New England and continue to make things, and I don't think this is my experience, it's our experience as innovators, because people who make things, we don't make the same things we made 10 years ago. We make them a little different. Otherwise, we'd have somebody else make them for us, right? It's being able to get that lifeblood of new products that we can all rally around. And you can't do that without creativity. So I don't expect everybody to be an artist, but I expect them to solve an open-ended problem, which is what's going to go on that piece of paper? What am I going to have to create and show you what I'm thinking about? And that also is something that doesn't get talked about a lot, but, but being able to talk about things that are unexplored or unexpected is what we're going to need for, for being in the future. If I think about the future for manufacturing, I'll tell you about the global things that make me interested. I mean, I like what I do. I like the folks I work with. They're smart, they like to solve problems, that's cool. But there's also a global need because a lot of things happened in 2011, 2012. Things like a tsunami in Japan, flooding in Thailand, that a lot of the folks that outsourced production to those faraway places said, you know, that's okay, but if something happens, I don't have a second source, I don't have anything local, I can't try to innovate with them because they're a world away. So we have a resurgence coming on, driven by the auto folks, but they help everybody, that's going to recenter manufacturing in the U.S. If we don't have the skill sets here, the job will go someplace else. It's a fact. So I look for the challenge to business to get engaged with the leaders. I personally participate on things like New Hampshire Scholars, being able to figure out how do we mentor folks here in the local area. We reach out and give some funding locally to the programs we think are valuable as, as a company. I think others have too. So RCAM, the reason it's here is because business is united with education. Now we got to use it. The folk that, the, the feeling of the folks that in education, if you're looking for businesses to say, hey, I want to get students engaged with you. Contact me, contact our OA people, contact the other local businesses. 
We'll come talk to you. We'll open our shops to you. We'll engage whatever we can, as long as it's not one and done, and that there's a continuing discussion, because I want your best students. I don't want the folks that are just some program, because the problems we have to solve are pretty difficult. And we're not competing against just other countries, we're competing against other states within the US. So I'm open for the challenge. Um, I think if you can't talk today about what modern manufacturing is with your kids, then I invite you to come, because I think you'd be um, amazed at what we do. And it might take you a, a process to get in or, or some connections, but we'll help you, because we're as interested in you are as getting them a place to, to work when they're done. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Maureen, for that vivid picture of what it is you stand for and what it is you're trying to do. And, and for the opening of the, both the corporate door and the personal door to solving problems. Um, it reminded me of one of my, my favorite mentors I carry around a lot still with me. And he always pushed in our heads, if there's a problem and it involves more than one person, you cannot solve it unless you can sit down and talk about it. And if you don't sit down and talk about it, it's just going to stay there and fester. And it sounds like that's what you want to do, is to open up those doors and get those people involved. And then, um, so uh, I thank you much for getting the uh, employers uh, part of the conversation started. If you heard something from Maureen, or earlier from Wayne, that you want to ask a question about, please jot it down on that paper or three by five card so that you remember what it was. Um, at the end of the, after the final speaker. I now want to introduce Alex Bates. Uh, Alex is the area general manager for Colon uh, Hotel Management. And if Colon Hotel Management doesn't ring a bell for you, then just think Holiday Inn Express, Lane Hotel, and of course our new Courtyard Marriott. Alex? Uh, good morning everyone, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm not a huge fan of public speaking, so forgive me if I uh, slip up anywhere along the lines here. Um, just a uh, quick background, I'm obviously from England, uh, southeast coast, I've been in the States uh, since 96, and then in New Hampshire um, for about nine years. Um, and so as Maureen was saying, one of our things is retention of skilled workers, so I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, I'm also very grateful to Tim Kim, uh, they're one of our, our clients and certainly we need folks like that for us to stay busy and, and have guests in the hotel. Um, Colgan Hotel Management, for those of you that don't know, is a, it's a fairly local company, we're based here in New, New Hampshire, uh, our offices just moved from Nashua to Portsmouth, we have about 24 hotels currently, uh, another five in the pipeline for this year and next. Um, typically franchise properties, Hilton's and Marriott's. The way the hotel industry is, is the, the, the Marriott's that used to be owned and, and run by Marriott typically now are all franchised. Uh, that's something we're seeing throughout the industry. So again, we own 23, 24 hotels, uh, more in the pipeline. I think our industry is certainly very much tied to the economy. So when the economy's doing well, we're doing well. Uh, no real surprise there, but we have our two main sectors of business are going to be corporate and leisure. So if businesses aren't doing well, they're not putting guests in hotels. If uh, employees aren't doing well, they don't have that disposable income, we're miss missing out on the, the leisure business as well. So we're coming off of, uh, as an industry, um, a, a few bad years right now. Um, it's also been very hard for us to find capital for uh, improvements in the product. Uh, but also for acquiring new properties. Colwyn is a little bit different. We've been lucky. Uh, our owners have had some cash, so they've been able to actually uh, take advantage of those opportunities out there, and that's really how we ended up in the Keene market. The, uh, the courtyard was built with the help from uh, grants with uh, MEDC. We acquired the lane essentially through foreclosure, and Holiday Inn Express, we picked up a pretty good deal because the owners there I just wanted to get out of the business um, and, and essentially retire. So we've been able to take advantage of those opportunities. 
I think now we're seeing the economy turn back around, so it's getting a little bit easier to get funding for uh, improvement, uh, new development. So I think that's something that we'll see more in the future now is growth in, in new builds and renovations. Certainly some properties, hotels typically are on a six year cycle uh, for a renovation, including what we call hard and soft goods, carpet, carpets, furniture, technology. A lot of that has been deferred over the last few years, so we've got older properties out there in the industry uh, that either need renovation or they'll essentially go to the lower end of the spectrum as new properties are built in those markets. Um, as far as job opportunities, obviously we run the gamut from fairly low skilled, low paying jobs all the way up to the high paying CEO type jobs. So, as Maureen said, problem solving is great, I'd love that. We start almost one step below that. I need people that can um, communicate. It's the social skills that we find are missing these days with kids coming out of school. They're so used to texting, half of them can't even write a letter these days. Um, you know, they, they're shortening words when they're texting to each other. The face-to-face -face communication is dying. We put them on the front desk in front of a customer, you know, a Marriott Platinum uh, client that's traveling the world, and they have a tough time even communicating with that person. So I'm looking for one step below that kind of problem solving. Um, it's just those personal skills that every step of, of our business, you have to have that from housekeeping uh, all the way up to, to the top of the chain. And that's one thing that, that certainly I'm seeing as, uh, as we get candidates is that there's, there's a gap there, definitely. Um, so I would say whatever you folks can do to help us with that, um, it would certainly be appreciated. The, the, the written communication, being able to draft an email, write a letter, talk to a guest, interact with a guest, not be scared of that interaction, it's, that's becoming increasingly harder for us to find these days. Um, our industry is it's fairly easy to get into. Um, I have <laughs> colleagues that have um, graduate degrees, others that don't, others that have worked their way up. They've started at the front desk, they've become front office managers, um, operations supervisors, AGMs, the GMs, and, and so on. So it's definitely an industry that's not hard to get into. Um, it's obviously very transferable as far as you can move all over the, the world uh, and those skills that you've learned and, and acquired there can be transferred. Um, at the same time, it, it's easy to transition into some other industries, not all, um, you know, but hospitality, restaurants, hotels, they all kind of go hand in hand. I see in the future, one kind of debatable thing that we're looking at now is what does technology do for us? Is it going to take away the guests in the future um, or, or not? Um, I think there's a lot of things like Skype, um, teleconferencing, and, and even we as a company do that, but we still want those face-to-face -face meetings where, as a people, I think we want to be able to touch things, see things, have hands-on experience. So I don't see that technology necessarily replacing the need for people to travel and get together and meet. Um, I do see it helping to augment that and add to it. But it's like, for me, my family's in England, I love to Skype with them, but there's nothing like seeing them face to face. So I don't see technology right now hurting our industry. You know, maybe down the road with 3D holograms and you can put yourself in a room, oh, sorry. Um, Maybe there, but right now I, I see this still as a growing industry, it's a growing population, people have the desire and need to travel. So I see uh, certainly no slowing down in the growth of hotels in the future. Um, with that, what I do see though is, is hotels definitely changing. Uh, again, it's inherently a service industry, it, it's fairly labor intensive. There are some products out there that we're seeing start to come in and maybe take the place of employees. They have now um, automated kiosks where you can come in, 
you check in with your cell phone, you swipe your cell phone, uh, even so far as you can take that cell phone and swipe it by your door and check into the room. So there isn't the need to have somebody there at the desk. Um, but I kind of relate this to the airline industry. You go there, they've got three cell service kiosks, but you've still got three people here. Um, so if somebody needs something, they're there, they're available. So I, again, I don't see technology right now necessarily re replacing those workers. Um, what I do see is from a, the, the hotel business itself is a lot more uh, sort of specialization. When I started as a GM, we were responsible for a lot more um, on-site um, HR, accounting, accounts receivable, accounts payable. That's all now more and more becoming centralized at a corporate office where the on-site manager doesn't necessarily need to have that broad skill set. Uh, they need to be able to scan the paperwork to corporate and, and they take care of it. So in some ways, uh, on property, I think we're seeing less of a broad skill set and then more specialized, higher paying jobs at the corporate offices. So that's something that's uh, kind of interesting, uh, particularly for me being on property. It's not, you know, my uh, responsibilities in some ways are, are becoming less. Um, again, with the, the future of just hotels themselves, I think we're moving away from the, the really big full service hotels. We're seeing a lot more um, smaller hotels, Hampton Inns, Courtyard by Marriott, uh, that are almost in some ways becoming smaller full ser service hotels. So for example, our courtyard here, we have a bistro that serves breakfast and dinner, we also have a, uh, a wee brew Starbucks, it's not full service Starbucks. But we're offering a lot more to the consumer in smaller buildings, if you like. Um, again, it's labor intensive, so if you have a 600 room hotel, if you're not filling all those hotels, it's extremely costly to run. So we're seeing, rather than one big hotel, uh, different brands that tend to be have very loyal guests uh, in one market. So for example, here, we've got now uh, five different branded hotels in the market. Um, Just on a technology within the guest room standpoint and, and the direction that we're heading, an awful lot. I don't think the industry is um, particularly, we're not a forward looking industry um, and create many things ourselves per se. What we do is we look at typically what's happening in the residential markets for what's the next big thing to come for, uh, for hotels, so flat panel TV. Really, if you look at hotels five years ago, nobody had a flat panel TV in the hotel. Um, in the last three years, it's become mandated by almost every single brand. It's, it's not a competitive advantage to have it, it's a competitive disadvantage if you don't have it. We're seeing constant improvements in the, the standards that are offered over the brands. So again, while we've moved away from these big full service hotels, the smaller hotels are offering the services that they did maybe four or five years ago. So at the Lane Hotel, we've got flat panel TVs, we've also got the uh, Curry coffee makers, um, iPod docking stations, so that people can bring those technologies with them and the comforts that they have at home and feel at least as comfortable in a hotel room and hopefully you know, a little bit more spoiled. Um, I get that's essentially it in a nutshell. Um, so again, for for kind of staffing the future, really people that have those social skills is the biggest thing that we're looking for right now. Again, I can teach someone how to check you in on the computer. I can't teach you how to interact with that guest. I can't. I can teach you manners to some degree, but if you've grown up with them, if you had that in your schooling. If you understand how to write a letter, how to respond to an email, those are the key things that I see for our industry when we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you for reminding us uh, that we're a system, and when one of us is successful, then all of us possibly can be successful. We're connected to, to good times and bad times. And I like it that your particular corporation 
even in bad times, is willing to step ahead of some of the others and do the investing in itself, even in not good times. Um, and reminding us of those social skills that we all are delighted to have when we check into some place or walk into a company or walk into a hospital and we feel that they've been waiting for us, um, just for us. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, we're next going to hear from uh, Art Nichols. Um, Art is the Chief Administrative Officer for Cheshire Medical Center, Dr. Hitchcock Keen, and the CEO of Cheshire Medical Center and its parent corporation, the Cheshire Health Foundation, and uh, is key to uh, what the, the corporation that, that Arthur represents is key to the health and welfare of all of us. Art Nichols, here you go. Can I take a peek at it? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. There we go. I, I missed the first part of the presentation, but I'm obviously not tuned in fully to the technology component and what my generation after that, I apologize. Is it, can you turn it down a little bit? Okay. Okay. Better. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the state of the industry uh, that I work in, which is which is healthcare. And I, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to have to say up front that I'm not going to be perhaps bragging about my industry maybe as much as my uh, uh, counterparts have to begin with. We, we in healthcare are on the precipice of, of significant change, and I think for good reason. Many of you have, have heard a lot about the problems in healthcare, so I won't dwell on them, but I, I do want to mention the fact, if you didn't already know it, that our healthcare system is the most expensive in the world by a factor of about two. And I think uh, if I was in Maureen's business, it wouldn't last long uh, in, a, in a worldwide uh, competitive mode if that was the case. So that's, that's where we're at as an industry. Two times, and, and maybe that would be okay if we were producing the best products in the world. But as, as many of you have also heard, when you look at some of the outcomes-related data, the United States uh, among developed nations is probably in the mid-30s. So, so the outcomes of what we produce at twice the price are somewhere south of Lithuania or you know, whatever. You pick a country. So that's not a great place to be in, obviously. And our industry is poised for change. It has to change or else uh, the country is going to go broke. I mean, we, you, you all know what insurance costs. So that's, uh, that's where we stand, and, and that's the challenge that we're facing. And, and I'm talking broadly, so I'm not, I'm not really just talking about hospitals, although hospitals probably represent about 30% of, of the overall cost of health and health care. I'm also talking about physicians in all of the other parts of healthcare, whether it be pharmaceuticals or home health or skilled nursing or whomever. So that, that is the backdrop for where we're heading. And so what kind of change are we going to be undergoing? Uh, first of all, let me back up. Wayne, the first slide that you showed, I believe, started with Title I in 1965. And I think that was the last time Congress really did anything meaningful because that was also the year that Medicare started, the Medicare program. So the healthcare industry has had a 50-year run dating back to 1965 when the Medicare program was implemented, a backroom deal between LBJ and I think Everett Dirksen, and, and suddenly Medicare came to pass. Medicare was a system that was designed to increase the supply of healthcare. Our, our nation really didn't have many hospitals, and not as nearly as many physicians as it needed. So the Medicare system was designed to bring more uh, resources into the system. And boy, did it ever work. It, it worked tremendously so. And unfortunately, the system has never been changed meaningfully to really change those incentives. So this is a classic example of creating a system that, uh, that produces what it was intended to produce. And our system, and, and I've said it many times, is intended to produce medical widgets. Okay? We don't get paid unless we produce a medical widget. 
whether it's a doctor visit, a skilled nursing visit, a home health visit, an x-ray, an MRI, or whatever. So therefore, um, it, as our resources and the number of providers um, has proliferated, we produce more and more widgets. Now, what, what does that do for us in terms of outcomes? Not much. <clears throat> and that's why we're well down that list of 30, 30, 35, 40 in terms of health outcomes, because we're not producing health outcomes. So that is really a long way of saying we're moving from a, a production model that encourages and rewards volume to a, a system that encourages and rewards value. Volume to value. <coughs> huge, huge difference, completely changed in our mindset that it is going to affect our workforce and is already affecting our workforce. Now, um, and this is my opinion, the Affordable Care Act that there's so much arguing about right now still has not pushed us over that precipice because the Affordable Care Act is really more about access to care than it is about changing the payment model. Changing the payment model is what will push us right out that door. And I think we're getting there. We will get there. It's difficult politically. But once that happens, our focus will be on value, be on outcomes. Uh, we, we're working on it, and let, let me just say, I think New England, among all the sections of the country, is way ahead of, of the rest of the U.S. in this regard, and, and even northern New England, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, probably uh, the, the highest, the uh, highest star. So we uh, here in, in the Cheshire County are already working on improving our outcomes. We, uh, we've talked a lot about Vision 2020. Vision 2020, I'm here to tell you, is not a market scheme is it's a way to, uh, to get you all, to get everybody in the county to think differently about your health, to, uh, to, to really appreciate and understand and embrace the role that you play in your own health care. You can't wait for the system to fix you because at least half of your health and well-being is due to your own individual behaviors. Unfortunately, our system doesn't pay us at all to keep you healthy. And we're, we're real happy to sit by, wait till you get sick, and then have you come in and amputate something or whatever you might need to do. <laughs> so, so that's you know, that's where our system is going, and that's my introduction. So very quickly, I'm going to move on to the, the effect on the workforce. We have a lot of uh, workforce issues bubbling under the surface. If you go back about five, five or six years. There were a lot of consultants in our industry that said, you know, you, you guys in healthcare better watch out because the demographics are going to get you. And what they meant was that the aging of America, so what you heard about this morning, uh, all of those people were suddenly going to get sick. Uh, matter of fact, we had some consultants right here locally in 2006, early 2007, that were telling us, you guys need to build a new tower. The Cheshire Medical Center is 35 years old at the time. You need to think about adding a patient tower, adding beds, because all the, all the old people are getting sick and you're going to be in big trouble. So we didn't listen to that, fortunately, or else we'd have a big white elephant of some sort in the back parking lot. Because what's happened is that the practice of medicine is changing, it's changing rapidly. So there is an increasing focus on wellness, keeping people out of the hospital, because the hospital is one of the most, uh, more uh, expensive components of, of the health care. So um, I'll, I'll just tell you, without losing market share at all, um, our inpatient census has gone down about 30% since 2008. And that's without losing market share. So how do we do it? Uh, we prevent unnecessary readmissions. We have shortened the length of stay. Essentially, you, you don't get in the hospital unless you're sick. And there are more and more things that are happening on an outpatient basis, as you all know. So back to the workforce. Okay, let's let's first talk about physicians. Tremendous uh, shortage, I think, is looming, especially in primary care. Primary care medicine. Everybody's heard about that. What people may not have heard much as much about is, is the, the maldistribution that exists in our country. So there, there are a lot of physicians here in, in the U.S. Most of them, especially the, the specialties, congregate around the urban areas. More people, they're growing faster, and the reimbursement is higher, by the way. So, and then most of the uh, most of the companies that are investing in new facilities are in those urban areas. 
So the difficulties that we see here in a place like Keene, but also our colleagues in Brattleboro and up the Connecticut River, Deerboro, as the older specialty positions retire, it's increasingly difficult to replace them. So that's, that's one of the big problems we're going to have is uh, primary care and specialties. Now one of the, the bright things about the workforce picture and, and something that I would advise uh, those of you who, who advise the high schoolers is to think about nursing. And, and I say nursing, I mean that in a broad context. Now, first of all, uh, thank you and congratulations to Keene State College for having uh, the DSN program now. So I think it's been something that we've been missing in the area for quite some time, and I know the program is excellent, and it's also fully subscribed, and I think it's really gonna help us locally. So we, we appreciate that very much. But the, the future for nursing is just getting broader, it seems like every day. So you, you read articles about um, um, nurse practitioners, first of all. Nurse practitioners in, in the U.S. Is, is, have been around for a while, but each state individually decides the breadth of a nurse practitioner's role, and that breadth is increasing. Now, New Hampshire happens to be one of the states that already allows a very broad range of practice for a nurse practitioner. So a nurse practitioner does not need a physician, for example, in order to, to write prescriptions and really to take care of patients. Physician's assistant is, is a, different, a different level, and they do need to be hooked up with a physician. Uh, we also have a uh, uh, certified registered nurse anesthetist, anesthetist, for example, CRNH, who also can operate independently of the nation. Now, each state does this differently, but the trend is to sort of broaden that role for uh, advanced practice nurses. And as you might imagine, that doesn't always sit well with the physicians. It does, by the way, take about you know, anywhere from eight to 10 years to produce a primary care physician. So the shortage dimension is not an easy thing to turn around to. It's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, what else might I say about nurses? It just seems like there's no limit to where a nurse can go. And I, I try to talk to my daughter into this, but she didn't, she didn't listen to me. My, my wife is a nurse, and you can know. Uh, it's, it's a career that can be in, in all kinds of different directions. Um, the, the other... The other areas that I think we often tend to overlook, and, and I would encourage you all, again, working with, with high schoolers, there are many other kinds of technical positions that uh, probably in terms of um, pay and status and whatever else, rank very, very much with nursing, but, but I think are largely ignored, at least I, I think there aren't very, aren't very many schools here in New Hampshire that produce these kinds of people, because we have difficulty getting them. So, uh, radiology technicians, for example, uh, which uh, I mean, imaging technicians, let's just say, it's a broader term. So <clears throat> MRI, CT, ultrasound, mammography, these jobs are very, uh, very well-paying jobs, well thought of, hard to get people uh, for them. Another one is um, radiation therapy tech. I don't know where they make these folks. They <laughs> are like, uh, the goal. We have uh, we have a very busy radiation therapy service here, and when we lose a dosimetrist, it's a crisis. We just died. Uh, we just lost one not long ago. But, but these jobs pay very very well. Just consult my notes here. The. Um, Things I wanted to mention about the skill sets. The skill, what, what are the, uh, the skill sets and the um, characteristics that we're looking for? I, I truly believe, I'm maybe old fashioned in this regard, but I think I don't encourage people to go into healthcare because they can, uh, they can make a good living, make a good salary, even though that tends to be true. I think you have to want to care for people, you have to have compassion, you have to have empathy. And, and it, it, I don't want to be cruel, but it's, if you're working uh, in a service industry somewhere and you're just tired of that and want to make more money, you go uh, quickly to a nursing school and enter the profession, you may not, you may not enjoy it and your employer may not enjoy you. You've got to go into it for the right reasons. Uh, I, I say this every month at new employee orientation. There is something special about taking care of people. And no offense, Marine, but we're not. 
we're making medical widgets, which are really related to people, and we're not making uh, a tool or, or a thing. We're taking care of people. So there's a little difference there. And that doesn't register or resonate with, with all people there in our industry. And that's one of the things that we're really focused on is service. People, it's expensive to get healthcare, number one. People expect us to be technically competent. What they don't expect is to come to the hospital or the doctor's office and be treated rudely or, or inappropriately. I mean, that ruins everything, and we know it, and we work hard with our uh, people to prevent that. The, uh, the interpersonal skills were mentioned earlier. You can't, you can't um, overestimate how important that is. Communication skills in general, something perhaps new to our industry is the notion of resiliency and, and um, having, being accepting of change. We've been the same for about 50 years in many respects, and now we're changing very, very rapidly. And uh, finally, the critical thinking skills. If you're taking care of a patient who's, who's ill, uh, oftentimes you may be the only one around you have to have the critical skills. So we, we absolutely need that. Finish up. I, I think that's where, where I will uh, leave my discussion. The people, uh, the, the one other perhaps uh, category of jobs I haven't mentioned would be the I don't know, maybe the term would be paraprofessional, but you don't need a college degree necessarily, although it's helpful. So things like um, uh, medical records, registration. Um, well, our, our business office, the, the billing department, all of those are, I think, excellent jobs, uh, generally carry great benefits. And the more education you have, the, the better. Uh, one, one of the interesting things is we're moving to this um, seems like everything's getting more technical. Moving to this system of coding called ICD-10, which stands for International Classification of Disease, uh, 10th version. The rest of the world is on this for years. We're just moving to it. It takes the traditional coding system and explodes it like a zillion times. So uh, if you have anybody out there that's really good with, with medical terminology and numbers, they have their future mapped out for them. And you cannot find these people. Again, you cannot find medical coverage, and they make good money. So uh, I think I will leave it at that, and hope you can think of some questions to ask us later. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Thanks for reminding us that it's not just physicians that we need to be concerned about, but all those support positions that need to have some of the common skills across uh, the various industries that we've been hearing about and we'll hear more about. Um, it's, it's not good news, of course, that we continue to struggle with health care costs and that probably has a, a major negative impact on investment in, in the health care business. But um, through it all, we're still going to need those employees that are well prepared. And thanks for uh, getting us a good cross sample of, of kind of preparation they may well need and the opportunities available. Um, our last presenter um, is uh, Greg Dixbury, who is the, uh, the president and CEO of one of our few remaining local banks. Thank goodness, the Savings Bank of Walpole. And Greg and I were, uh, were uh, mates along with uh, Jeff Sari uh, in trying to figure out what the music was all about. And he was way ahead of me. So, if you think of bankers don't keep up with their music, you're wrong. <laughs> it's consultants who don't keep up with their music. Uh, I'm still singing Doris Day songs from the early 40s. Uh, it's Doris Day. <laughs> anyway, um, so Greg's going to talk to us about the finance industry and uh, what its status is and what its needs are and will be. We had a nice connection because I found out, I knew that a young man who was my son's best friend, my youngest son's best friend, all through grammar school and, and still were through high school and, and afterwards, um, in fact, they went to 9-11 together to be part of the support system for, for, for rescuers. 
Uh, they went to New York City the day after it happened. It scared the hell out of me, but I was proud of him and proud of this other young man too. And it was great to have Rick City. He's one of our up and coming young stars, and, 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 and they really like him. So I felt connected in that way right away. So Greg Tuxbury, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I guess it's my pleasure to welcome you to the afternoon. So I won't uh, spend too much time between now and lunch break or, or your bathroom break at this point. I think at our age, uh, we need that. <laughs> um, our industry certainly is changing uh, before our eyes with technology, so I'll spend a little time on that. Um, but uh, a quick example, um, uh, I'm, an, I'm an, uh, a Gen Xer, so I just fall over that, uh, that young group. Uh, but, well, um, I, re I recall Wayne um, figuring out when school was canceled by listening to the fire siren in you know, downtown. At 6 o'clock in the morning, if, if it went off three times, I knew the school was canceled. Now we get an automated phone you know, message from you with your voice on it saying your kids' um, school is canceled for the day due to inclement weather. So um, that's in one generation how quickly that's changed. So, um, and banking. Um, I always enjoy following um, art in any conversation because I feel uplifted in banking after hearing <laughs> about healthcare and some of the challenges that, that they have. But I'll spend a few minutes to talk about our industry and overview. And um, there, there are some um, similarities between healthcare and, um, and banking and the financial services industry overall. Um, I'm going to spend more of my time talking about community banking. Um, there's certainly, we're part of a larger um, group, the financial services industry, does include insurance, wealth management, and, um, and banking overall, but um, where my comments are more focused on is, is the community banking space. Um, it's shrinking, and it's shrinking rather quickly. Um, in the last 10 years, we've gone from 9,000 banks in our country to 7,000 banks that we have today. We only looked 20 years ago, we had um, 12,000. We go back 30 years, we had double the number of banks we have today. Um, most, most analysts who study our industry say we'll be in the three to 4,000 banks probably in, as, as soon as five years from now. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Did we do it to ourselves? Um, what's happening is just the need for consolidation in a commoditized industry. So it's, it's, it is going to shrink. Um, we all deliver the same product. We probably don't need that many banks. So the question is, what is the right number of banks, um, financial service outlets that we need? Um, time will tell, but does that mean that um, um, it doesn't provide opportunity for students um, graduating high school and college? Um, certainly not. Um, although the number of banks may be shrinking, it's really coming through consolidation. Um, there's not a lot of synergies that come out of that. Um, the reasons why banks are coming together, together are more from the regulatory perspective, um, needing to bring talent together um, to operate the global environment, um, but we still need the folks in our retail shops. Um, the number of branches, although there, are, there will be fewer, still they're not going to be half of what they are today. So we're going to need the folks um, to, to, to run our banks um, five, ten years from now. Um, I think it's an exciting opportunity, quite frankly, to be, to be in our industry. Um, it is evolving. It's evolving quickly, as I said. This is the future of our industry. Okay? But this doesn't speak well to uh, the future of how do we bring people into our industry. Um, but this is how, um, when I check my balances, I work in the bank. Um, I check my balances online with my phone. If I need to make a deposit, it's a pain to go and actually stand in line, um, hopefully get good customer service that Alex is talking about. Um, so what do I do? I just take a picture of a check right, and I deposit. That's what I do. Um, it drives me crazy when my kids ask me to go deposit a check. Well, I don't have their, you know, I can't take a picture of their check. I have to stand in line. Um, so our industry is changing from, from a technology perspective, and we have to change along with that. Um, one of the good things about um, the, the, the opportunity to in, get into our industry is we're old. Okay? I mean, we are really old as an industry. 50% of our employers in financial services will retire in the next five to eight years. 50%. What, it's, what it tells you is that we haven't created 
a lot of good opportunities over the last 20 years or haven't really created the right image for our industry over the last 20 years for people to jump on board and get, and get in. Um, so with a lot of us retiring, and we look at the 50% the, 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 the that will be retiring, we are 30% older than any industry that we compare ourselves to. And I can tell you that there will be banks around years from now. We are critical to the economic prosperity. We are the medium of exchange for, for finances. We will, will, will be necessary 10, 20 years from now. But what we have is a gap in bringing in really good, talented folks is we haven't done a good job encouraging people to think about our industry um, to working as a career. It's a vilified industry, always has been, um, will be for some time. Um, we're easy targets. When, when we go through periods of time like the mid-2000s and do some probably not so good things from a consumer-friendly perspective, um, we get slapped on, on the wrist um, by the regulators. Um, and quite frankly, we wear a target on our backs for some period of time, and the kids have no interest in, in getting into an industry that when they um, listen to the 6 o'clock news every night, um, the bankers are being badgered. It's just that's the fact. So let me bring you back to a little bit of community banking where I see um, a lot of our opportunity for, for our kids. How most of us learn how to be a banker, we work for a large bank and we went through a management training program. And you, you got experience through all of the different facets of banking. Most of us know bankers as, well, you, you got a lender and you have a retail depositor. But there's so many other facets that, that we work in banking as technology. Finance is a critical aspect for, for banking because what we're trying to do is mix and match these, these um, uh, financial assets, deposits and lend them out, making sure that we have available, available liquidity when people come in. Um, tremendous opportunity for those who, who enjoy finance. There's a marketing aspect um, and, and, and several sales, whether well, it's in the wealth management aspect, we're going to talk about lending. Um, where we have, um, um, so we used to go through these programs and we learned a little bit of all of those and you came out with kind of your own passion and you went into finance or you went into lending or you became a credit analyst or you got into the wealth management. Those days for the most part are gone. The top five banks in our country, and we know who they are, um, basically own 90% of the deposits. Okay, it's not the 80, 10, 20 rule but the top five banks, and they will continue to grow in size. We can talk about too big to fail and what legislative measures are, are underway to try to break up these systemically risky institutions, but they'll continue to, to um, grow. My sense is most everyone in this room probably has a card in their wallet or purse that has a logo on it that either says Bank of America, Citigroup, you know, Chase, something either a credit card or a debit card. Um, so they'll continue to grow. They've got wonderful market share um, and they've got some very innovative products that are worth having those cards in your wallet. I do. Um, but but what, what's, what's happening is um, the smaller banks need our young students to, and we need to do a better job attracting them um, to come join us and learn about what community banking is all about. And yes, we need those skills that Alice talked about. We need those social skills. But we need the innovative skills that Maureen talked about. Um, we don't think of banks as being innovators. Sometimes you don't want them to be innovators. It didn't work so well with you know, some of our collateralized debt obligations and these mortgage-backed securities and things like that and subprime mortgages. But from a technology perspective, um, in our shops, um, in our little bank um, here in, in Keenan Walpole, New Hampshire, um, we've got a group and we call them our innovators. There are young guns and they, these kids, um, we're, we're, we're fostering an environment for them to come to us, um, to teach us what we don't know, you know, as, as our senior leaderships are old, we're, we're old, we're in our 40s. Um, <laughs> so, so, 
what we're looking for in terms of skills. Um, um, individuals that can communicate. That individuals that have a desire to teach. They need to teach us. And I tell them that I grew up in public accounting. I started my career. And, and you know, year one, I learned from my senior accountant, right? Year two, I was a senior accountant. I was teaching a first year accountant. I was learning from my, my manager in a public accounting firm. And the year after that, um, you, were, you were always learning from the person ahead of you. That was just the way it was. Today, we're asking our students to come in and teach us um, what are, what, how are people getting their information? How can we deliver our service? How do we use this to deliver um, our product? So, the, and the, so they need to be able to teach. But, but what we're missing is their appreciation, and that's my word, um, of some of the traditions and fundamentals of our industry. We manage people's money. They expect a certain um, um, aspect of, um, I don't want to call it tradition, but the, the, of, of responsibility. And they want to be, they want their letters to be written in a way that pr professes professionalism. Um, they, they, we need them to kind of honor some time-tested traditions in banking in an innovative way. And we're finding that that's the gap. If we can get our kids to appreciate, and as we're learning to appreciate their way of learning, communicating, expressing themselves, their flexible um, hours, their, where their, um, um, their need for personal time versus working 70 hour work weeks, as we're learning to appreciate them, what we're looking for is for them to appreciate why we do what we do in certain aspects. And that's when I think we can have a powerful um, team of, of generational gaps. Um, have them appreciate why um, people will put and trust their money with you. And you have to care for it. And there's a certain aspect of that caring that needs to be to come through in professionalism. Personally, um, uh, 22 years ago, um, I lost my, my, my first son, um, passed away. And um, I was on a high rise and in, in the company and going, going fast and it was all about um, upward mobility. And I did work those 70 hour work, work weeks and that, that's what I was taught. Um, but I said that in his passing that I was, I was gonna come back and do something that was really valuable. I was gonna give back to, to the community that was there for, for us when, when he died. And there's been nothing more rewarding than being a community banker. We do matter. And as, as um, Amy was saying earlier, if, if the kids are finding a need for mission-based opportunities and they're not thinking about banking, we need to, we need to as, a, as an industry, and we look for our, our counselors um, as, as guiding them, um, for them to consider an old, stodgy in industry that we need really good young talent. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, <coughs> for marrying the elderly quality of the business with the interests and the talents that are available and coming out through the system today and saying um, that, that's a good match and, and all the various uh, reasons why. Also, thanks for sharing part of your personal story as your own influence on why you like to create community and be, be a major part of it. Thank you for that. Um, we have a few minutes, just a few minutes, hardly a few minutes, but let's see if there are any questions that you have for any of the presenters. Um, you know, Wayne or Maureen, Alex, Art, Greg, something come up for you that uh, you're, you could override your stomach's yearning to get to that back table? Yes. Common Core uh, stuff that came out in 2009, 
that supersede everything that came before, or are all those things still in play as well? And how does that kind of how does that conflict? Everybody hear the question? Okay. Yeah, the Common Core does trump uh, any of the mandates that had to do with each state setting up its own curriculum and its own way to assess the, uh, the results of student performance. Common Core is different. Each state will no longer have its own set of standards. 45 states have adopted the Common Core. And each state will now have a similar uh, system to assess. Ours will be smarter balance, it will be about half of the states that will use that uh, system. So the change with student growth will trump the proficiency, whereas you get to 100% proficiency by 2014, student growth will become the new measure, so that's very different. But instead of schools that do not make adequate yearly progress in becoming schools in need of improvement, you will have focus schools and priority schools. Focus schools will be schools that are low performing. Priority schools will be schools that have big gaps between special ed, socioeconomic disadvantaged populations, and the regular population. So Common Core trumps almost everything. But NCLB is still in effect, even though it was to be resolved in 2007. But Congress has had significant difficulty uh, coming to grips on a common new direction. Thank you. Another question. Back to Jim Logan's and the purpose uh, from what, where we came from out of the Pathways to Prosperity report that, you know, was trying to make the point that only about a third of the jobs will require a four-year uh, degree. I think we, I wonder if we're not still overselling uh, the value of a four-year degree if only a third of the jobs are going to require, and obviously Keynes stats are like at 56 percent uh, going for a four-year degree. There's still that a, a bit of a disparity there. My real fear is that we're not well serving the two-thirds of the students who don't who won't need a bachelor's degree. I think we're kind of glossing over the skills that we're giving them, and we're hearing every speaker say they need better communication skills. Alex may not need somebody who has a bachelor's degree, but they have to write a good letter. The banking, hospitality, they all have to write a good letter. Um, I don't know, I guess I'm concerned where the focus still is and that we're not helping the, the other students be successful. Have, have the decent skills to, to get those other jobs. But the last slide I had uh, prior to Keene High School, Greg, um, the, where people went to pie chart, had to do with the Ed 306, new standards. One huge uh, change, the new standards will include engineering and technology skills. That will be part of the expectation, part of minimum standards, part of our accountability. So that's a shift because of that understanding. We know in New Hampshire about 80% or exports or light manufacturing. In Keene, in, in our area, 28% of the revenue uh, is generated through manufacturing. That's why we partnered with the RCAM, the Regional Center for Advanced Manufacturing. We're trying to connect, and Jim could speak uh, for hours, but we're trying to connect the skills that our students need when they leave high school, not uh, to the kinds of needs that our employers have in manufacturing in particular. That is a real target for us, and I think we've made some good good progress. Common Core ramps up everyone. In order to get through Common Core, and we will have an exit exam someday soon, uh, and it will be referenced Common Core. So that ability to compute at that level, much higher than now, the ability to communicate through liter in, with literacy skills will be much higher than now. We will have better prepared students for the workplace I know that students are coming out today with these huge bills, and they're starting to ask themselves, really, is that $80,000 debt that I have chosen worth the path that I'm on? And I would contend that, as some of our speakers have said, if you have passion, 
If you need to create that debt in order to realize your passion because you care about the job or career path you've taken, it's probably worth it. Otherwise, you know, few students probably really realize that, at least in a, in a decade or two. Okay, let's take the time for one more question. Yes. Hi. Uh, this question is really not a question, but I just want to reiterate what uh, Maureen said about the need for creative problem solving in the area. My name is Paul Sunnishaw, and I run, I'm the director of operations for Carlisle White Line Flooring in Swansea. And I can certainly say that that is a huge need, that we have a lot of followers not a lot of leaders, and if we don't have any issues, the operation runs great. Whenever we have an issue, the ability to have people that actually can creatively solve problems is huge for us. So whatever you can do with the educators to, to try and develop that skill, I think that would be a huge help for them. And uh, Greg, I, I did want to have one comment for you as well. You mentioned the top five banks. I'm not one of those. I value the, the small banking and the, the personal touch. I was with one of the top five banks five years ago, decided to move on and did my business with a, a much smaller bank. And very much appreciate your service and your extra touch. So thank you. Well, the um, marrying technical skills with personal skills seems to be common across. Uh, we got some conversation this morning uh, earlier with Hannah and Amy about uh, how to cross some of those boundaries and barriers that we experience. Uh, and thank you so much uh, to uh, Wayne and Lorraine and Alex Art and Greg for sharing your view of what's happening will be very valuable for us this afternoon. So thank you so much.